and uh, and then let's see how we go. So there's us there. So now we're so now we're streaming live on on Facebook, uh, and okay. it, people are uh, joining us. Hold on a second here. I'm just. Uh, if people are joining us, I, I just want to make sure that they know that uh, we're, we're, we're live. We're just getting our uh, getting our technical bearing straight here because um, because sometimes we uh, I we did one thing last week and I didn't show up on on the video because. I was, uh, I was, uh, for some reason, I, I wasn't there. Uh, we touched something, but now we should be good. Uh, so okay, if, good. If, if people, uh, so uh, Luna, Luna Gemero is joining us. Hi, everyone. My name is Emil Guillermo, uh, the uh, museum director of the Filipino American National Historical Society Museum. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, we are just getting some of the technical stuff out. And if you're an early bird, uh, the early bird catches the worm. And so you can uh, see us here talking about uh, different things. The official program begins uh, live at uh, at 12 o'clock. But we, we get an, an early start because there's lots to talk about. And for example, now I'm going to <clears throat> double check here to make sure that that we are uh, pushing this out live on uh, out on face it says we are but you know you, you just you gotta you gotta double check and um so let me uh, do this meanwhile uh we have a, a good discussion plan we're going to talk about the far well we're the thing called the FWC. And I mentioned the FWC because I don't know if anyone knows what the FWC is. I mean, does, does anyone, and, 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 that, and Fonz is going to do a whole big thing on the FWC beginning this, this, uh, you know, next, you know, uh, cycle in the Filipino American National Historical Society. It's an every two year thing. And this year it's gonna be Filipino activism. They're gonna they're gonna discuss the FWC. And I thought, well, we ought to start talking about it now in September before in advance of Filipino American um, History Month. And so that's why Luna is here. And Luna, thank you for joining us. I'll give you another introduction, but since we're just sort of uh, in our, our our intro informal phase. Uh, I just wanted to let the early birds know what we're doing. So uh, Luna, thank you, really. Thank you for joining us from the, the wonderful Central Valley with the palm trees. I, those, aren't, those aren't Central Valley palm trees though. No, we wish it was. <laughs> yeah. So we, we should have a good conversation, but uh, like I like to do before we go on, I like to just to talk about a number of things. Like uh, for example, we do this thing here on uh, the virtual uh, pop-up. And remember, this is a virtual pop-up because uh, the museum, once again, is closed because of COVID-19. Uh, and uh, because of that, like about four weeks ago, I decided, you know, we're gonna be closed. It doesn't look like you're gonna reopen. Some museums actually have reopened in some counties where they're They've dropped down a level uh, where they can open under certain circumstances. Where we are in San Joaquin County in Stockton, we are still at um, a high alert level. So we're closed. And we're closed until further notice, until the numbers drop down and we can show some kind of consistency in controlling COVID-19. But when we do get the high sign to open, we will be open until then. The virtual pop-ups are your way to check in with the museum from wherever you are. You can be in 
New York, in Florida, in Livingston, in California, in Southern California, in Northern California, uh, you can check in with the Fonz Museum through these virtual pop-ups. And so ever since we began doing them, it was a way in which we can engage with you out there about Filipino American history. And one of the things I like to do in this preamble before we get to our guests and Luna standing in and thank you, Luna, for sitting there and, uh, you know, you can chime in too in the conversation, but we have this thing that we call this week in Filipino American history. And, and Luna, what do you think happened this week in Filipino American history? This Some week your, in Filipino? Yeah. Well, I'm saying I do this program called this section of the program called This Week in Filipino American History. And so with your vast knowledge of Filipino American history, what do you think happened this week? What, what, what historical thing happened this week? And you can say, I don't know, Emil, what, what, what is it? Or what, 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 would you, what would you say? Well, today is September 18th, right? Right, right. And it was, it's just really weird, but uh, two days from now, um, on September 21st, martial law was declared in the Philippines. Ah, so that, yeah. So that's a, yeah. this, I, that's a, and you know, that's a, that's important because a lot of people say, well, what does martial law have to do with Filipino American history? And it has everything to do because it really yeah. divided the community really between exactly. people who are pro Marcos right. and people who are anti Marcos. Right. Okay. Right. All right. I re now, we want to get to that when we talk to you about your segment, and that's a good point. But I wanted to point to a couple other things that happened in history, uh, namely, on September 16th, Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta finally came to their senses, and the, the National Farm Workers uh, group that they headed joined the Filipinos in the Delano Grape Strike. That was on September 16th, 1965. And for those of you who want more context on that, knowing that the Filipinos were first, you should check out some of our other videos on the Filipino American National Historical Society Museum page on Facebook. That's uh, Facebook at Fonz Museum. And if you go on that page, you'll see other other videos that we've done within the last couple of weeks, uh, specifically the one with Alex Idalor, who talks about growing up in Delano and how his mother and father went on strike before, before at least a good eight days before the, 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 you know, Chavez and his group joined on September 16th. And you'll recall it was because Larry Itliong went to Chavez and said, look, we need the numbers that, uh, that the Mexican Americans or the, you know, that, that the Mexican workers who are coming in would provide. So that's one point of this week in Filipino American history. Uh, in addition to martial law, you know, on the 21st, one more point on the 16th, the US military begins withdrawal from the Philippine bases in 1991, and once again, you might say, hey, wait, what, what does the visiting, you know, forces agreement have to do with uh, Filipino American? Well, that thing was was done because of uh, the U.S. relationship to the Philippines. It's the reason why all the bases were there in the first place. And the the fact that the Philippines has the withdrawal began 1991, but to this date, there's still some form of the VFA intact. And so it shows that there has been some wavering between the US and the Philippines as far as how much US influence we still want in the Philippines as Americans, as the US. And I, I point to this, uh, this VFA idea, uh, because just last week, you might have heard the Jennifer Laude case where uh, Laude was murdered. She's the tra Filipina trans woman who was murdered in 2016 by a U.S. Marine corporal. That corporal, uh, Joseph Scott Pemberton, was 
was convicted and within the last two weeks was pardoned by Philippine President Duterte, pardoned and then deported. Pemberton is now back on U.S. soil. And the question that I ask in some of my writings and some of my columns is, where is the activism behind justice for Jennifer, Jennifer Laude with Pemberton back here on U.S. soil? Are we going to see a protest movement about either the VFA or the Philippines, uh, you know, Duterte wanting some kind of cover for his human rights violations in the Philippines, if he's looking to the U.S. to curry favor by this act that he's done by pardoning Pemberton? Or are we going to see the Philippine American LGBTQ community come out and say uh, or speak out in protest against this uh, pardon of uh, Joseph Scott Pemberton? And will we see people ask for or demand that the Marines court-martial Pemberton for his acts committed in the Philippines? So many things that come out of this idea that, hey, on the 16th, the U.S., the nationalistic forces in the U.S., or in the Philippines, began the end of the, uh, the bases agreement in 90, 1991, and still, all these years later, have wavered, reinstated it, and now find themselves with a, a good reason why those bases shouldn't be in there, because you have cases like the Laude case, an historical case, and it's something that we, we you know, continues, because we'll see how people react to the Laude case as we know that her murderer is now, now back on um, back home here in America. So just two things, or three things on this week in Filipino American history. And before we uh, talk uh, to our guest, Luna Jamera, who's standing by to talk about the FWC, I think it's also uh, a good a good time to uh, mention the passing of. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, which is really, I you know, uh, to Luna, where were you when you heard the news about uh, Justice Ginsburg's passing? I was home and I suddenly got the, the news, you know, one of those breaking news flash things. And right. the first thought I had was I knew she wanted to hang in there until after the election. But, you know, she had, she won, I mean, so many battles in the past with her, with her health. I mean, and yeah. she won, yeah. of course, so many battles for, you know, women's rights, you know, human rights in general. And so she, she'd been such a, a tireless worker, you know, I mean, she earned her, her rest, that's for sure. Well, but yeah. I'm concerned about what's going to happen going on, going forward. I hope they do honor her her request, which she did not want to be replaced until after the election. And yeah. I hope that uh, that does happen. Yeah, that was uh, one of her, her granddaughter revealed to NPR yesterday that that was her dying request, that the replacement or her replacement be named by whoever is newly installed as president. Now that could be the current president or that could be uh, the challenger, but already we know that uh, Mitch McConnell in the Senate has said there will be a vote and that President Trump will get to, to have a vote on whomever he feels should be the replacement. Uh, there's all sorts of politicking going on and we're less than 24 hours after uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg has passed away. So I don't think it's inappropriate that people talk about it, although there should be some, you know, maybe uh, maybe a little time where people can just reflect on the, the great things that she did, as you said, Luna, for, for women, for all people of color, for all minorities. And one of the things that I thought about as I, you know, I, I was pretty, pretty stunned. I, we all knew it was going to happen because as you pointed out, Luna, she's 
were, you know, been recovering from the last bout was lung cancer, but first it was, or the last bout was pancreatic cancer, but uh, she was uh, battling lung cancer. She battled colon cancer. There were so many cancers that she had to, uh, she had to endure. And I know from knowing some cancer patients that one of the biggest things that you don't want when you're fighting or, you know, fighting this disease in all its forms, you don't want stress. And what could be more stressful than being a Supreme Court Justice of the United States? So, so there goes Luna. And let's, uh, no, let's I mean, don't go on the internet because I'm on an interview yeah, right okay. now. Go on the internet? Okay. You can use the phone. I don't care about that. Okay. All right. Let's, let's I'm on an interview. Don't use the internet. Okay. Okay. I had. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the things about doing this. I had to, I had to mute you, uh, Luna, because our audience was getting uh, getting the background of you uh, admonishing someone for using the internet. So, but that's all right. That's all right. Uh, but now I'll 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 unmute you now. But uh, I I was saying that you know Justice Ginsburg had to endure so much, and as can you imagine the stress being uh, a justice uh, uh, on the Supreme Court and being known as the most senior person on the liberal wing of the court who had to be, she had to be the doorstop on everything, on, on every issue that would want to shut the door on minority rights, women's rights, uh, you know, gender rights, you name it, abortion rights. She had to be, and if you ever saw her in person, you know, she was this diminutive type of yeah. less than five feet or about five feet. In fact, when one of the things that when I lived in Washington, D.C., one of the things I did for my mom was before she died was I had her come stay with me when I lived in Washington, D.C. for uh, a couple months, I think she was with us, or maybe just seemed like a couple of months. But one of the things that she really loved was to go down to the Supreme Court and stand in front and, and just stand on the steps of the Supreme Court. And um, I thought of my mom. My mom was not Ruth Bader Ginsburg, only in stature, only in her size, a woman of four. I think my mom was 4'11". Uh, but, uh, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you know, they talk about, is there going to be an Asian American on the Supreme Court or maybe a Filipino American? There could be, there could be, but you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was our Filipino American yeah. on the <laughs> Supreme Court for, for all that she did for issues that were important to the Filipino American community. So you know, we're, we're not partisan in any way here at the museum or at Fonz, but we do think that, or I think that this is going to change. It should change your opinion about the election and how important it is. If you didn't think the election was important before Ruth Bader Ginsburg's death, well, certainly I think you should now. And I think all, all people should uh, uh, get out the vote, as they say. And I, I, I got a couple of notices on my, uh, my email box that there are at least um, there are a number of uh, get out the vote activities all across the state, all across the nation. So, you know, our, uh, you know, we, uh, we remember Ruth Bader Ginsburg. We remember what she did and uh, let's, uh, you know, go forward and try to make sure that we, we, we live by her values and we make sure that we, uh, uh, you know, go out there and vote. I mean, however you vote, you know, you know, for whatever candidate, you know, she was, um, an I idealist when it came to our democratic values, when it came to equality and justice and uh, so we remember Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Okay, right. so 
Okay. So we have, uh, we got this week in Filipino American history, and I think we should be right at about our time when we begin our, our formal program. Yes, it's, look, it's, uh, we're, yeah. we're right there. It's, it's, it's noon, and that's when we say we usually begin the regular portion of the show. So um, without further ado, Luna Jamero, part of the illustrious Jamero family. <laughs> We've had Peter on our program uh, before we started these live programs. But really, uh, your family here in the Central Valley are so important. And when I was talking to, you know, we're going to talk to Tony Ogilvy tomorrow on this week in Filipino American history and talking about the FWC. But when I was talking to him, he said, you know, Luna Jamero, she was at the FWC. And I thought, well, we've got to get Luna to here to talk about the FWC. So the first things first, a lot of people, does it, do you know what the FWC was or is? And then the people say, well, I don't know. And then they'll say, oh, wait, it's the Far West Conference. And they said, is that like the Big Ten? Is that like the Pac-12? Is that like a football conference? Or do they, what sports do they play? And I say, no, FWC, the Far West Conference had to do with Filipino activism in the 70s. And so, Luna, tell me, what was your involvement when you first heard of the FWC? Where were you and how important was it to you? Okay, first of all, I want to correct you on the acronym for FWC, which is actually the entire name of the conference was Far West Young Filipino Conference. Okay. So, yeah. Far West FWY far yes, west the Philippine because it it had it was trying to attract the conference organizers were trying to affect uh, to attract the young young people a lot of college students uh, were in attendance at that conference so F but F far west conference is fine in terms of you know the the simplicity of it but the actual thing was to include far west young filipino people's conference well august I, of 1971 yeah I, I stand corrected especially since we're both now no longer young but but, but all right tell me it, it started in 1971 yes um and preliminary to the far west conference um i was i had just returned from a month's trip in the Philippines. And, uh, and prior to that, I had just left, just left my job as a social worker with the county. And I was working uh, with a community based program through the uh, remember the poverty programs, the Community Action Council, the war on poverty, I decided to leave my social worker job and I took a job uh, working in anti-poverty programs with Jose Bernardo. So it was a summer of big change for me in the first place. Um, but so you, preliminary no, to that, you know, being in the Philippines, being in the Philippines, um, I got a different perspective that I never had before, which was that feeling of that importance of where my roots were and who I was as a Filipino American. All right, so let, let, let's go. Let's go back a little bit for for people who don't know you. Your father came here in 19, 1929, I believe, right? Right. He came in the twenties. So he came first went to Hawaii. Right. Yeah. First Hawaii, then and came the came to to California. You mm -hmm. were born here, right? And so you were a Filipino American, born here, right? And how close were you to your roots before you went back to the Philippines? I was very close to my roots, even though I wasn't born there, because we grew up on a labor camp. And mom and papa operated a labor camp from the 40s up until like the 70s. So it was really like a, you know, it really was like a little village, a uh, little barrio of our own right here in the middle of Central Valley, California, because it was all Filipino laborers. Uh, but they were really, 
the town mates, most of them at the beginning were, were mom and papa's town mates from Bohol, uh, which is in the southern part of the Philippines and the Visayas. Mm -hmm. And uh, so many of them were uh, from Bohol. And, and they were like family, they were, they were our, they were our family. And um, so much of the way I was raised was very much on that camp, on the camp, it was like living in a, in the Philippines, because a lot of our surroundings uh, were very much, um, I mean, even the things that we did, we ate communal style. Uh, there were, of course, a lot of uh, gatherings in the back, which we call picnics, which were actually uh, chicken fights. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and, and we had upwards to, you know, anywhere from 70 to 100 men at our camp. So, you know, and they were all Filipinos. And, and of course, they spoke the dialect. I never did speak the dialect fluently. But, um, you know, we were able to always understand and, and communicate with them very well. And most of it was just, you know, they were very, they were like our uncles, they were family. All but, right. You know, so, live yeah. so, so yeah. Luna, so you grow, grew up here. It was like being, it was like the Philippines in America, essentially. And it was very rural because it was a labor camp. You grew up and go to high school. You come of age, you go to the Philippines, and what did you discover there? How did that reinforce your roots or make you see things even differently? Well, it did re it, it overall it reinforced my pride of being Filipino, but it also brought to the forefront, you know, the the big social and political unrest that I saw there, the poverty that I saw there. And when it's your own people that you see living in such poverty stricken conditions, even though I had been a social worker here in America, I saw poverty. When you see poverty among your own people, it really hits your heart even harder. And uh, this was in 1971. This was just before uh, the martial law. A lot of the unrest was already brewing. I was, I was very uh, struck by seeing armed soldiers at every place we went to. Um, I could feel it in the air that there was definitely a lot of, uh, you know, political and social unrest there in, in the Philippines. However, we went to some areas that we were able to escape from a lot of that. Manila was, when we were in Manila, I felt more tension uh, of all the places. But once we went into the barrios, and especially my parents' town, uh, my parents' uh, uh, province, which is Bohol, it was a lot more peaceful, although there were signs even there. And um, so, but, you know, <laughs> it was quite an experience, very eye opening. It was really my summer of, uh, of, re of really recognizing who I really was and identifying more uh, as to who I was as a Filipino. So, you go to the Philippines and you come back to America, and the America you came back to, you, you, you uh, referenced the the great society and the poverty programs. You're you're in an era here, 71, just six years after the Voting Rights Act. So about seven years after the Civil Rights Act. Uh, we have Johnson and the, the great society, the poverty programs that are starting to come up throughout the country. And there's a there's already a sense of we got to reform how we how we integrate everyone into our this great society where were filipinos in that mix were filipinos recognized or were filipinos ignored i think filipinos were recognizing the fact that we needed to be recognized for our contributions yeah. and you know that started you know uh, uh you know the the fact is the uh, larry it young and the farm labor movement really put you know, put us more into the forefront of, of uh, recognition, not as much as, 
they're you know, deserved or Filipinos deserve, but nonetheless, there was a movement that was started. It started many of uh, many, it started in the college campuses, but it also started in our local communities. And I want to uh, go back to Stockton because I moved to Stockton back in 1967 after graduating from college. And, and, and when I moved into Stockton, which was the late sixties, that was when they, Stockton was under a big, urban renewal. So when I moved in, when I first drove in, I thought, oh my God, El Dorado Street is gone. Everything was gone. It was just rubble. It was as if it was a war zone. And I was so upset that all the places that mom and papa used to take us to when we go to Stockton, they were all gone. There was no, there was no such thing as El Dorado Street as I remembered it. And so, you know, the local community, especially the Filipino community, started to rise up because there were a lot of displaced Filipino families and especially the Manongs that were living in the surrounding hotels, uh, which was formerly in Manila town. And, and you know, the, 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 the city officials really didn't seem to have any plan to uh, you know, for the displacement of all the people, uh, I mean, all the Asians that were in that neighborhood, you know, a lot of businesses that got lost because they just bulldozed through it. And, and they, they had this, the whole time I lived there, or the first few years I lived there, they started working on this, what they call the Crosstown Freeway. And then it ended up being a crosstown freeway that led to nowhere because it didn't get finished until several years. So there was this destruction of a culture, our culture, our history, that, you know, it started to really wear on people. And when I moved there, I wasn't involved at the beginning, but I know there was Jose Bernardo, Ted Lapuz, there were some of the college students from UC Davis that helped to do the research on, on uh, what eventually ended up being uh, funding for the Filipino Center, which at that time in 1970, in the 70s was the first, uh, was the first minority owned sponsored federal housing project. So we really went on the map as far as, you know, uh, putting notice to everyone that, hey, we're here. We have so an issue and we're doing something about it. So this is happening. It comes out of the, the great, uh, you know, momentous changes from the 60s. And yet you still describe something in Stockton like, you know, the Filipinos weren't they were impacted, but sometimes they were negatively impacted because uh, they were still not quite uh, recognized is what I a, a sense I get or like you said they had no plan during the redevelopment or they didn't they, they had uh, uh, no plan of what to do with the displaced Filipinos say around that crosstown freeway right so how did that um, so all of this is happening in 71 and then you hear about the FWYC the far west a uh, youth conference, and how did that sort of set off, uh, you know, the, the the light in your head to say, hey, I got to be part of this? Yeah, well, lots of bells and whistles went off because also that summer of 1971, I was running a, uh, I don't know if you remember, it was called the Neighborhood Youth Corps. Oh, I and remember for the Neighborhood first, Youth Corps. Remember, remember the Neighborhood Youth Corps? Really I, was running a, I was running a project uh, under NYC, and um, it was it it was funded through the Community Action Council funds, and we had mostly Filipino youth students that we that worked uh, under our NYC program. It was a project targeted to a survey of the displaced Manons that were in the hotels. It was also a way for the youth to also understand the history of what the Manungs brought to our country and what they contributed. So we had a survey, we were mostly concerned about, you know, if they knew where they could move to, what other better housing they could, they, uh, they could be referred to, their health issues, special need issues. 
And so we had Filipino youth actually going downtown Stockton to the hotels for, uh, under supervision, of course. And uh, this was the Fox Hotel. I don't know if you remember the Fox Hotel. Oh, yeah. 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 And, and uh, I remember uh, going up to the, uh, going up those steps and my, uh, one of my coworkers, Lorena Cabanero, in fact, she and I went up to visit Manong Johnny, because one of the students had said they they went up and they met him. He was blind. And, you know, but they said, you need to go meet him. You need to talk to him. So we went up and and sat there for a whole hour with Manong Johnny, who was totally blind. And he told us of his history when he came to this country and how he became blind. He was with a... Uh, I believe he was with a white woman on a, you know, on a date or whatever it was. And at that time in, in the, in the, in the thirties, I think it was the late thirties. Um, many of the white folks, especially the white men were very protective. And of course there was a lot of racism going on. So he got beaten up one night and he lost his vision because of that. Because of, <laughs> he, was, he was dating, he dated, a, he was with a white woman we know that there are anti-Filipino riots and anti-Filipino violence because of, you know, they're seen as taking jobs and taking women. So he was, he lost his sight. That, he right, just, lost his sight. And I mean, he, he was still able to work because his sight didn't get, didn't, he didn't lose it right away, but he gradually lost it. Oh, yeah. But, you know, I mean, he was a very proud man. He still was able to cook for himself. I mean, it was just the resiliency of, you know, our Manons will always, always inspire me. Well, you know, I know, I know that generation. That's also the generation of my father. Um, he stayed in San Francisco, didn't come into Stockton. But now these, this was an NYC program. He did a survey. So you're here in 71. How did the FWYC come into play as, hey, that's, that's what I need to do. This is where well, we need to go. My, that was my lead in to the, to the Far West Conference. I had all these students. And when we got the information from Seattle about the Far West Young Filipino People's Conference, of course, they were just so, so excited, you know. And so I met with their parents. I met, you know, we had several meetings uh, to to plan to uh, to have a caravan, a car caravan, to go up to the conference, and uh, there was I, at least I think there were a good dozen of uh, Filipino youth, uh, average age fifteen, that uh, we drove up in a caravan of like three or four cars, and um, so. <laughs> Let me tell you, if I if I was asked to do it again, I would probably say, "Are you kidding me?" <laughs> because it, no, it really was. It it was not only you know I I was a parent at that time, I was a single mother, but to have a car full of teenagers in a car who had never left ever left their parents' home, much less the state, you know, and to be in the in, in, in a car full of mostly other teenagers and myself and another uh, so-called adult. We were both in our mid twenties at the time and they were like in their average, you know, average 15. So of course, you know, we, we had some, we had some issues along the way, you know, I mean, well, well, we had- well, tell me, well, Luna, tell me well, what, ha what was the appeal of going up to the FWIC? Why was it such a big deal? Why did it have, why did you have to bring these kids, these students up to Seattle uh, to be part of this? Well, their awareness was already, already they tasted that awareness of Filipino history because of that project with the Manongs and the hotels. And they also wanted to meet other Filipino youth in other areas, right? And, but I said, look, this is a learning situation, you guys. There's going to be workshops because we had a list of different offerings from the Seattle conference, things that had to do with education, things that had to do, you know, with 
things with issues that they needed to be aware of because they were in the middle of high school they needed to start planning for their own future and and um and to learn who they were as uh, to learn what our history was so they were very excited about that and that was really the the motivation for us to go not just the partying but obviously to connect with other filipino communities to connect with other filipino youth and um that's pretty much what happened when we got there but let me tell you when we got there after like a 16 hour road trip we got there and we were signing in registering and all of a sudden i looked around i had never in my life been in a room full of nothing but Filipinos that were there to learn, to become more aware. And it was just a very exciting time. And I told I told the students when we got there that, you know, they're gonna we're gonna be there. We're gonna be, they're gonna be under watchful eyes, but they were pretty much on their own, you know. So um I had uh, it was sad though, the first negative negative reaction I got was when I was signing in, there was this guy that was born in the Philippines and he started talking to me in the dialect in Tagalog. And I told him, I said, look, I'm Filipino, uh, I'm American born. And he said, well, how could you be Filipino if you don't even speak the dialect? I said, you're the reason, and that kind of attitude is why I'm here, is we need to start, we need to start talking, you know, as if we're one, one, body of people i mean we're not we're not just philippine born american born you know we're here to unite as filipinos in this country tell me was here tell me was he yeah. uh, a part of the group yeah he was taking registration he had I, he got pulled aside because i was really pissed off and somebody somebody from the organizing committee knew that i was and so he got he got uh he got chastised pretty well. Well, you yeah, know, the thing is, is that that's just one of the differences between, you know, you want the youth to come here and most of the youth had to be people who were like you born here. Right. I, although, because I don't, well, in 71, there might have been people who immigrated. Uh, the immigration law opened up in 65, but they would have had to be recent immigrants. Mm -hmm. And so there might have been a split. Was there a split between native born like yourself and Philippine born? Oh, yeah. I mean, that that was apparent in a lot of uh, communities, not just Stockton. Um, and the Filipino youth from Stockton, they were already at that stage of rebelling against their parents who were old school, old country, and, you know, still tied to the traditional Filipino organizations that you know, I mean, Stockton Filipino community was close knit, but they also were very competitive. They had a lot of organizations. Every time a Filipino didn't get along with another, they just they just organized their another another club or another association. Right. And and right. you know, and that's what we saw too growing up as as Filipinos is that you know there was there were a lot of organizations, but yet as a whole filipinos were not recognized on on the you know in in america as americans as as contributions to our society we, we were still a very close-knit society and knew who we were amongst ourselves but nobody else knew about us yeah but, so, uh, so, so what was the learning opportunity um what what was the goal and what were you, what were people trying to get across to these young people about how to advance Filipino Americans in America? Well, let me tell you the uh, theme of the Far West Conference was quest for emergence. I still remember that for some reason, but it was intriguing because if you really think about what that means is that we were and still are an emerging people in this country. You know, we've gotten a lot farther since 1971. But at that time, there was a call to action. There was a call to action in terms of what a lot of the college students were going through in terms of not being able to uh, 
you know, get the financial aid that they needed to go to school. Uh, there was a lot of things going on in terms of, you know, destruction of, of uh, their own community because even, you know, in the in the Bay Area, you had the International Hotel we had in Stockton, you know, the the Manila Town and El Dorado Street being destroyed. Little Manila. And so there was, yeah, the social and political climate at that time was a call to action, and a lot of us were not formally organized. I was at that time just really getting into the politics of the community. I was, you know, I was establishment before I started working with Jose Bernardo because I was working with the county. I was a social worker. I was not happy in that system because it was a perpetuation of the same thing. It's like, you know, we're, I, I saw generation upon generation of, of people on welfare as a social worker, but yet there were too few opportunities that were, that were gonna be there to get them off of welfare. And so I, I decided I, to go and throw my hat into the um, community-based organizations. And, uh, I, and we had more, there, there was a lot more people that I was able to, that, that thought like me, I was inspired by them. And I, I believe that that was the beginning of my own activism i i guess if you want to call it that so luna who was there who was there who inspired you i know that fred cordova uh the founder along with dorothy uh the founder of fonds was there uh th there was no fonds before right this no, is no. so this is sort of like a precursor to the filipino american national historical society itself but oh, tell me about the the inspirational people you, you saw there that said they gave you this Filipino American awakening? Well, there was, you know, like you mentioned, Fred and Dorothy Cordova, who I had met through my brother Pete previously because Pete was living in Seattle and I had met them at a different time. But I got to know them better because of the Far West Conference. And, you know, and, and of course we saw how organized they were in Seattle. They had the Filipino youth activities drill team. You know, they had the, you know, the FYA, uh, the fact that they got this far west conference together and the people that went there from, from places that, and, and that represented, you know, some very, um, resourceful people were there to give us information on what we needed to do as as in organizing we also had the radicals there because of the of what was going on in the philippines and and some of the bay area people that came uh spoke in terms of what was happening in the philippines and the impact it had on the united states and american born and one of those people was rodel rodis and uh Rodel Rodis was like, I had never ever witnessed somebody like him in person. I mean, I'd seen uh, many people speaking uh, like he did, you know, on TV or in other places, but this was really the first time when I really saw the power and the presence that he had to rally, to rally so many people uh, and be so passionate about what was going on in the Philippines. Well, but I, I know Riddell, and I'm glad to call him uh, a colleague, a, a friend. I've known him for, for many years. I think I first met him around that time as I was in San Francisco. Actually, I, I, I think I met him more like in the 80s, um, right there in the thick of the, uh, the anti-Marcos movement. Well, what was it about Rodell? He was at that point, he was a, just a student or he was, uh, I don't think he was think, a lawyer at that time. At that I time. think he was a student at that time. I'm not sure. And, and he was, I mean, you could tell he was very well read, very intelligent, but a little bit unsettling in terms of, you know, who, because our question was, is, is the fact that yes, we did we did care, we do care about what happens in the Philippines. That's our mother country, you know. But we also had issues here in 
the states as Filipino Americans. And so I think that was always a dilemma between, um, you know, between that, between what Rodell was trying to present and the issues that we were being confronted with as Filipino Americans here. And what happened um, is we had many discussions about that. The first, I think it was the first night that we were there. Anyway, I got involved in a rap session with a bunch of other uh, Filipinos that were there. Anthony Ogilvie was one of them, Ben Menor, my brother P. And, and it, was, it was really kind of like one of the first times I ever was able to share intellectually things that, that were going on that usually were discussed on the news. You know, you rarely ever got to, had a chance to talk about issues like this. But we came up with an idea, which a concept, which was a Filipino Information Referral Center. It was a proposal, it was a concept. It was a way that we wanted to connect with other Filipino communities and to be to offer resources. And so that was something that came out of that conference. Even though there was, you know, the unsettling uh, division and, and, and that, that followed the Far West Conference because the Far West Conference, which was in Seattle, 1971, spurred right. Right at least four more conferences that and the second one being in Stockton in 1972 it that was the also the far west conference young people's conference we fall i was co-chair along with morris artiaga for the 1972 conference and it was held at the university of pacific as you well know the university of pacific was known back then as being very lily white in hardly a place that you would see very many Filipinos in attendance. But we happened to get that as a venue because um, the co-chair, Morris Artiaga, had some ties with some of the, the people in administration there. And we were able to convince them that this was an educational thing that we could do for the campus. It would be a great way to promote um, the campus. And so our conference, which was held in 1972, following the 1971 one in Seattle, it brought many of the same people back uh, and re reunited on our campus. I think we had, oh, I don't know, somewhere around 600, almost 700 people in attendance. Uh -huh. Now, it, now I was in Stockton, but how many were in attendance up in Seattle? You, you said- In Seattle, I would think, I would think there was at least 500 to 600. I really don't know the the, the actual attendance, but you know, there. I I think we drew more to Stockton because, you know, we did have this uh, Bay Area. We had a lot of the Northern California communities. Southern California came up, uh, and 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 I'm sure that we were pretty much around the 650 mark. Well, it was it was also the second year, uh, but but you did say when you went there the first time in Seattle, which will be 50 years in 2021. Right. Uh, and it's the reason why Fonz has designated it as one of the the key the key points of its you know biennial uh, convention. It, should we be able to meet again? Let's hope you know we'll be able to meet. But what what was it about you saw so many Filipinos in a room? Why, I, why was that so important to you, a young woman, Filipino American growing up? I mean, you're talking about the uh, the smaller group, seeing Tony Ogilvie and and your brothers, and talking about uh, these these intellectual things that you saw only talked about on the news. Why was that important? Were Filipinos seen as having access to those those worlds, or were the Filipino voices seen as being relevant or important in that time? No, we weren't. We didn't have that kind of recognition. And I think the fact when you saw so many Filipinos that were very aware, that had so much to offer, you know, that you know, that the fact 
was that we're not sitting at the table with everybody else in terms of civil rights even, that it was our time. And I, and I think the quest for emergence, which was the theme of the Far West Conference was spot on because we needed to grab hold of that and, and say, look, we need to, we need to take that responsibility and start the conversations in our own communities, you know, because that what that spurred us on being in a room full and listening to issues that we all had in common as Filipino Americans. That was not something that happened, at least not in my existence, in my experience. And I was 26 years old then. Yeah, you know, but the thing yeah. is that 71, right, when the Far West Conference first took place in Seattle, it's some seven years, seven years after the Civil Rights Act. And it's almost 10 years after some of the really, you know, uh, some of the major civil rights battles in the South took place. I mean, I'm talking about protests and demonstrations. Did the Filipinos feel a part of any of that prior? When people mentioned think, civil rights, did people think, hey, did Filipinos think, hey, that's us too? You know, I, I have to tell you that when I was in high school and a lot of the civil rights, a lot of you saw the burning of, 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 of so much, so a lot of destruction, the burning of cities. And I remember my parents who, you know, were immigrants and, and very conservative in the sense that, you know, they believed that we had to stand up for our rights, but they didn't like the fact that there was so much destruction that had to go along with it, you know? And, and so there was that dilemma and, um, and, and we weren't at the table then. I mean, we weren't, in the coalition of the civil rights, it was like a, at the beginning, it was like black and white. Well, where's the rest of us? You know, we're not there, you know? So, and, and Filipinos, you know, they, they, they learn to, you know, not, I don't think they wanted to be passive, but be, the beginning of the, the history of this country when they first came here, it was volatile. They were not welcome. And so when they finally started getting some rights, when after the World War II, when they were able to find the, the, the veteran, the Filipino veterans were able to get housing, decent housing. They were able to get jobs in the government. These were things that, you know, the, that they never had or would have had had they not been involved in World War II. So you know, uh, some Filipinos became very conservative after that, I think, because they wanted to protect what they had. Yeah. And they when, never had. Yeah. And when you combine yeah. Catholicism, you combine a sort of, you know, obedience to the oh, almighty, you know, colonial, uh, they brought us here and we had troubles here. But now hey, we fought in the war. We got some of what was due us. Not all. I mean, there are still some vets who did not get everything due them after World War II, but those who were here and went to fight in World War II were able to qualify for the GI Bill, which was right. essentially the first wave of affirmative action for Filipino Americans to become and join the middle class. Right. So if you were lucky enough to come here just young enough to qualify, or the you know the war effort it wasn't easy some were and some weren't my father for example wasn't but that 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 created a very a very conservative filipino american community right where did the radicals come in cuz you were talking about radicals and referring to i guess Rodell and some others but well, so when you at at the far west conference was it a mixture of I mean, it was a spectrum, right, of the kids of the conservative Filipino community, maybe some semi-woke people who were like you in their 20s, just came back from the Philippines. And then there was, a, you know, Rodell and a group of students who said, hey, uh, we need to be part of this civil rights, you know, coalition, which is essentially what it was, because if you're not part of the civil rights coalition, right. you're part of a 
you're you're nowhere in the black white continuum. So, exactly. so what was that like at FWC at the Far West Conference? Was it some well, you know, tension? I, even though we felt a little bit intimidated by, you know, the passion and the and the very opinionated things that we were hearing, it was also very inspiring because. It, it it inspired me to become somewhat of a radical myself because I remember when when we were sitting there listening to all this, we're, we're thinking about, hey, Jose Bernardo was thinking about running for, for county board of supervisor, right? And I mean, that's a political thing. We need to support him. We need to organize ourselves. You know, we need to get behind uh, getting people on the on the boards on the education boards in Stockton we started thinking in terms of if we want to be at the table we have to raise not just raise our hand but we have to demand and say hey we're here and we need to be heard and I think that was what happened at least it happened to me I became I guess I didn't know I was becoming an activist but that's what happened and I eventually ended up even being one of the people on Marcus's blacklist because I was identified as an activist, whether that was, it was incorrectly reported or not. But, you know, there were several of us, by the way, from the uh, Far West conference, uh, conferences that were held that were named on Marcus's blacklist, 150 Filipino American born. Hmm. Right. And so this really was the FWC in 1971 really was the beginning of activism within the heart of the Filipino American community. For me, it was, you know, there were things going on in other communities, but it was that was the turning point, I think, for a lot of uh, folks like me that uh, were all we were in our mid 20s. You know, we were we were just out of college. We we're just finding out uh, that the establishment wasn't all that it was cut out to be. We were, we were disillusioned. And so, you know, yeah, there were a lot of, a lot of things going on at that time. And if it wasn't for the seventies, you know, I, you know, they, they used to say things, I don't know if you ever heard this, uh, comparison. I remember talking to this Filipino organizer from San Francisco and he said, you know, Filipino movements are like a likened to the banyan tree, you know, the, the tree, the banyan tree. Yeah. And the banyan tree is one that you light it, 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 it strikes up and creates a big fire, a huge fire. And then just as quickly as it's on fire, it's gone and it's nothing but ashes. And, and I, I thought when he said that to me, for being an organizer, I thought, okay, he's trying to tell me the reality of what you face when you're dealing with a movement, because this was the beginning of a Filipino American movement. Okay. And um, many of our communities after the 1970s and during that time in Seattle, we got to connect with each other. We got to sit and talk about how much we had in common and we shared addresses, we shared phone numbers, you know, we didn't have cell phones at that time, we didn't have fax, we didn't have none no of the inter no internet, no, there's no, no, no internet, no nothing. And no that's Facebook. why, exactly, that's why in a way, I was, I was very, um, when we came up with the concept of Filipino Information Rever Referral Center, it was a network, a network for Filipino Americans to connect with each other. Well, guess what? That's what the internet is. Yeah, right? it was. It was your Facebook. Yeah, it was our Facebook. But we, and and out of that email, out of that, we different communities had different sections of the proposal to write, and so we all wrote. Uh, San Francisco wrote portions, Central uh, Stockton did. We all met at people's houses. And, and of course, at that time, I don't know why, but I guess proposals, you had they had to weigh at least 10 pounds to be significant, right? So, and that proposal actually made its way all the way to the HEW office of who was then 
Tom Mercer was head of HEW and we went there. He was going to fund us, but guess what happened in 1973? The dismantling of OEO and all the funding that could have funded that project. So, oh, is it was this Nixon, uh, Nixon? These oh, so Nixon once year. again the politics. Right. Exactly. The great, the great, yeah, the Great Society of Johnson in '68. You're exactly. getting momentum. '71 happens. You get momentum. '70, '72. It was Nixon and McGovern, and McGovern loses by a landslide to Nixon. Right. McGovern was the Democratic nominee. Nixon now the disgraced uh, Republican. Uh, who won, and he just began. Although he did do some some good things, he he did have to see, he did start the EPA, but OEO you saw it yeah. go by the wayside. So did it, it ever go to come to fruition where you were funded by? You said the HEW Health Education and Welfare, which I guess is now HHS, right? Or kind of, they split it up. Right, all that was restructured. So, yeah. you know, we, we didn't get the funding for it, but it was like, it would have been a, about $100,000, you know, but we had, we got their attention. We actually got to meet the guy in command because I don't know if you ever read uh, the book by Thomas Wolfe, which was the Mao Mowers and the Flat oh, yeah, 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 Ra and radical, that, radical chic and Mao Mowing and the Flat. Yeah, Cap radical chic. And I mean, it, that book really got to me because it was so representative of that's what happened. That's how they did not want to listen to us because if you wanted a meeting to demand a change in city hall, they would have some assistant or some clerk sit down and talk to you. No, I don't want to talk. I want to talk to the guy in charge. Right. And so, so we became Mau Mauers in a way, you know, and, yeah. and the flat catchers, we said, we don't want the flat catchers, you know, but that, that, that was a very, uh, uh, to me, a, a very, it, 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 it made quite an impression on me, which followed me even to today, you know. Well, I, well, I, well so you, well, what happened though? Uh, you, you Mau Mau'd the flat catchers, but did you get what you wanted in the end? Well, you know, in some cases we were able to, I mean, point of fact, I mean, look at, here, here, let me go back to 19, the early, 19, uh, late 60s and um, what was going on in the Filipino community and which, which ended up in, in being discussed at the 1971 conference. And that was going to the city hall, protesting about you know, the fact that there were a lot of displaced families in because of the downtown uh, renewal. And they got, they got, they finally got some attention. They were, they were pointed to the right resources. There's somebody uh, identified that there were funding, that was, there was funding available for housing. So, you know, if you get to the right people, you know, things can happen, you know, and, you know, then, and then we ha also ran um, uh, a, a Filipino, uh, a Jose Bernardo was running against an incumbent uh, a supervisor for the county, Carmen Perino. He was a Italian guy that was in office forever. And of course he was revered by the by the conservative Filipino communities because he always showed up at all the Filipino parties, but that's all he ever did. And until we finally started talking to a lot of the Filipinos and saying, look, you need, we, need to, we need a change. Why do you think Carmen Perino was simple? Oh, because he is coming to our, our parties. He always gives us a plaque. That's not change. That no. is <clears throat> what we want. All and right, so we started with Jose Bernardo, which got a lot of, attention finally but we, but we came win. close to yeah, we, yeah go ahead he did he didn't win though he, he you weren't able to unseat perino no we were sitting there we were within less than 200 votes mm -hmm. and and for that and, and 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 we were very proud of that campaign because we got that close uh to overturning a, an incumbent well, this is a part of Filipino history, Filipino American history in Stockton in the San Joaquin Valley. But if I were a young person listening to this, number one, I think I'd be kind of surprised at how unwoke Filipinos were in general and how a group 
went up to Seattle to wake everyone up. I, would that be a fair assessment of what happened that that there was a, a group of woke Filipinos in 71? And how have they done in the last 50 years? Have has it has it changed the community or have, how far have we have we gone as a community in 50 years after the Far West Conference? So if you're talking about Stockton, and because I spent 30 years of my life there, even though I was not born and raised there, I lived there, I worked there, and I got involved in the community there. But if you're saying what impact whatever we did in the 70s had to the development of uh, Filipinos awareness, I think it had a lot to do with, with where we are even today. I mean, we were able to get, we were able to get um, very, we, we were able to impress people like Dr. Don Mabalun, who was from, maybe she wasn't from our generation, but she knew of what some of the things that we did. When she went on to college, she, she became very um, uh, much wanting to learn more and develop uh, the idea for bringing back Manila, the little Manila. And, and that wouldn't have happened if we weren't back then doing anything in the 70s. If we didn't have, we had the Filipino, after the, uh, in Stockton, we had not only the Filipino Center, but we also had the Filipino Multi-Service Center. We had a, uh, a center in downtown Stockton that I, uh, I wrote a project for, and it, and it targeted a lot of the, the Filipino senior citizens at that time. And there were proposals that were being written when we had the money. And, uh, you know, we had Filipino Bayanian that was run also as a project in, in, so there were a number of different community-based organizations that Filipinos started to um, organize around. And we had uh, project, we had programs for the immigrants. We had job training programs. We had- uh, we All right, there were things that had, there were things that happened, but you would have to say, if you were looking idealistically in a dreamlike way in 1971 toward the future, are we quite where your dream was or we, we still have a ways to go? We still have a ways to go. You know, we, we, look at, we look at where we are, let's just say politically. You know, we do have more Filipinos and you know, we've got Rob Bonta now, you know, but we, we don't have anybody in the, you know, on the congressional level yet, but we're getting there. You know, we have a lot of folks. Well, we have one, TJ, TJ, TJ Cox. TJ yeah. Cox was Mestizo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right. Yeah. He, and, and he's up for re-election right, right now too. So exactly. I, mean, I, I guess what I'm saying is what do you think has, I mean, because I look at the last 50 years as being well we've progressed but there's still kind of like a not exactly a stall but we just haven't gone as far you mentioned bonta but bonta just after just a couple of terms he was the first he was the first and which is hard to believe so what do you think has held us back and would do you think we need another resurgence of an fwc to remind a, a new generation that, hey, we laid the track, time to you know, put a new train down these tracks and lay more track so we can go further. What, what, do you, what do you think has been the problem? You know, I think you're exactly right, Emil. I think we do need a resurgence, you know, I, and, and we do need a reawakening. And, and I, I mean, it's not just, in our Filipino community, we saw it happen in our own country, in, in, in what happened in the last election. We saw too many people that were complacent and the complacency is the killer. And, and I think people got comfortable with some things, but you know, complacency is, is a thing that, that really stalled us, stalled us as uh, 
in, in our growth, not only as Filipinos, but in our country right now in general. You know, we, we are at a place that, you know, we look at it, we're, we're going, the clock is going backwards, you know, and, instead of forward. And, and again, you know, I think that Filipino Americans contribute to that too. I was at a conference in Chicago and that was a couple of years ago. Yeah. And I was really very surprised that there was such a, there was a majority of Filipinos that vote, that voted, uh, you know, for Trump. And, and, but again, like you said earlier, it has a lot to do with that profile of, you know, they're devout Catholics, they're very conservative, you know, um, that kind of thing. And, and they go along with establishment and, you know, but, but yet we still need, what, what we lack today is that we don't have a younger presence. We don't have those 25, 26 year olds that are engaged. You know, your college campuses, well, right now we're all under lockdown with COVID, but back in, you know, in the late sixties and the seventies, you had a lot of uh, outspoken young people speaking out from college campuses and they made their voices heard back in their own communities, much to the dismay of their own parents, but yet they were speaking out. We don't well, have. Yeah. You know, what's funny is that back then you're right. The, the parents came, the young people grew up here or came and grew up here, uh, went to college, got outspoken and and so we don't really have that today. I mean, we have everyone sort of comfortable. They're happy they're here instead of the Philippines. Uh, and the young people just want to get a, you know, doctor, lawyer, tech job or whatever. Um, and they don't see the community as being something to fight for <coughs> the same way that you saw the community from your background as a, you know, in the labor camp. And uh, for your background as a social worker, what do you think separates the young people of today and the young people in your day in the seventies? Well, one of the things that separates young people is the internet, the cell phones, all the devices and the apps that are out there that separate them from the art of conversation. Okay, so I, I think we've lost the art of conversation in many ways because of the internet highway, because of, you know, the high tech, because of everything that, you know, there's always a new shiny toy out there, right? And, and every time there's a shiny toy, it, it distracts people further and further away from the real issues, you know, that, that matter. I mean, you know, we didn't have that back in our days. You know, we had, we actually read newspapers. We actually listened to Walter Cronkite every night. You know, we, we actually engaged in conversation and that's what we need. We need to have this again. And, and it, it, it's my, my own grandchildren, you know, too. I mean, and we're all guilty of it. You sit, you get together at a party. What does everybody have next to them? Their cell phones, for God's sakes. Yeah. Put them down. Yeah. You know, we don't need a cell phone. How, how important is it that you have to have that cell phone there, right? Yeah. And, yeah. You know, I don't know if anybody has seen it, but I'm going to do a, a promo for this. It's a documentary, kind of a docudrama called The Social Dilemma. Oh, saw oh. that last week. And, you know, Absolutely. you're right. As you were talking. Yeah, as you were beginning to talk I, about the apps, right, I, right. I thought about my experience when I watched that last week and I thought, oh, yeah, this you got to put down Facebook. But here we are on Facebook. You need to use it selectively, like only on the Fonz Museum page, maybe, right, maybe right. your, your page. <laughs> but right. but you're right. Uh, the, and the way the algorithm works, it. It, you know, it funnels news to your friends and we only get what we want to hear and we don't get the full picture. And no, we don't. And, and, you know, news was, they reported the news then. We don't get like talking heads. We don't get all the, 
bells and whistles that we have today. We just got raw news, you know, and and today's news is there's so many filters on it. It's like, come on, come well, on, you guys, let's just get down to the basics. Let's get down it, to the facts. It's hard to get. It's hard to um, get the truth when you're only getting one side um, on the internet, and you're getting it on the internet, and the algorithm pushes the news you want to hear versus the news that you need to know. And, and in the meantime, we denigrate uh, legitimate journalists and legitimate mainstream sources that uh, we call that fake news when in fact, the algorithm is creating your own little news, which isn't necessarily fake, but it's not necessarily always true. And it's not certainly it's not balanced, nor is it fair. So um, I don't know what the issue is. I know that I, as a, a journalist, uh, I do, I practice opinion journalism, and that's sort of one of the things that if opinions are fine, if they're based on a, a journalistic approach, but a lot of opinion is based on gossip, based on right. uh, this, you know, on hearsay. And when that's passed as news, and when people glom onto that and then repeat it, suddenly you have uh, people repeating, it's like playing telephone, right? You know, a little bit of the information is passed on to one another and suddenly the initial message is totally distorted uh, from the end message that, uh, you know, that we see exactly. uh, in front of us. Exactly. So I, I don't know. I, I know that I hope there were some young people watching this or, or uh, hearing our conversation because I think the Far West Conference was an important thing. And I think we need something like the Far West Conference again today. And maybe that's FONS, maybe that's programs at the FONS Museum. But do you think that would help uh, young people today if they had a sense of our community and the history of our community and what it's been through? Oh, absolutely. You know, that awareness, they need to have that awareness. They need to, you know, if you don't know your history, you know, you're not going to know yourself as well. And and I think that once I discovered that Filipinos have made huge contributions to the, to the development of this country, I felt more part of it. I didn't feel that much a part of it. I felt like an outsider until I began to learn about our history and what we've done, you know, and, and on the backs of you know, so many of our Manungs is where we stand on their shoulders and we stand on the shoulders of many of those that have, are still in the movement. And, and, and the fact is programs such as this, Emil, where we just get a chance to share our opinions, you know, this is a good beginning to start that conversation, to get our younger people excited, to get them passionate about you know, where, where they want to see their futures. I get concerned about, you know, where we're headed, but, you know, my future is a lot more limited than my grandchildren's, you right, know? Right. Well, you know, I, I think that we all should just, uh, I, you know, I, I bet you during this quarantine period, are you Zooming more with family and friends? Yeah, yeah. I'm Zoom fatigue. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's important to to connect, um, you know, uh, when you can. I know that I I'm I'm zooming more and trying to connect. It's important, and uh, I I think that I think everyone discovers the history on their own time. Like for you, it was a far it was a far west conference. Sorry about that. For that you, you, it was a far west. <laughs> For you, it was the Far West Conference. For this generation, what will it be? You know, hopefully it'll be some kind of awareness that comes up in maybe in college, maybe uh, an awareness that comes up in, I know, uh, from, from reading a book or from listening to a program like this. I, I, I just hope, I like to see more young people come to the museum. I'd like to see more young people, uh, you know, pick up Don Mabalan's book. Little Manila is in the heart. I like to see more young people at the at the Fonz conferences um, because this is a a broad community. And one thing that through these Zoom meetings 
in Zoom conference calls, we, we get to see people from around the country who's in, who are interested in Filipino American history. So um, uh, just uh, any final thoughts about the Far West Conference that I didn't touch on that you'd like to, you know, just uh, you, you corrected me already on Far West West Youth Conference or Far West Filipino Youth Conference. Uh, Filipino Young People's Conference. Young People's <laughs> Conference. What, what, what have, what, what other points do you want to make before we, uh, we end our program today? Well, first of all, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to share. You know, I, I had so much, I didn't realize I had this much to talk about. I, I looked at my watches, my God, it's one o'clock. But, you know, in summary, I, I just feel like we, again, we need to continue our movement. We need to continue the passion. We need to continue our commitment you know, not only as Filipino Americans, but towards making, you know, towards making our lives and our future better for all. So I yeah. don't know what else to yeah. do. So. Well, it's, it's important because wherever you are in the continuum of Filipinos, you know, you realize that you are part of a continuum that began uh, early in the the turn of the 20th century, 1904, when the first Filipinos were brought here uh, mm -hmm. at the World's Fair and on through from the 1920s to the 1960s, 1980s. <laughs> and I'm just looking at our uh, at our uh, chat box and people are saying uh, they're talking about things like uh, how uh, different Filipinos are were treated uh, and, and their experience. Uh, one person says, I've experienced Filipinos born in the PI tell me I wasn't Filipino because I didn't speak the language in the 1980s. I was born here and I was bigger than most of the PI born. There shouldn't be a jealousy or I'm, I'm better than you issue. We should all unite as one people. So I think that's always been an issue, unity or mm -hmm or coming together. Mm -hmm. I don't know what, what it's gonna take going forward. I know that in the, in the 60s and 70s, it was Marcos. I don't know, going forward, is it a, is it Duterte, an, an anti-Duterte thing, or, pro, you know, or is it a, a feeling that there is a coalition with all people of color, with the, you know, the entire human, uh, civil rights community what do you think or you know and that's young people you know going to school going to college go, you know taking part in part in ethic studies gender studies seeing what it's like to be a part of a a vocal minority that you know has that have goals that have social justice goals and certainly i think um the weekend where we were thinking about Ruth Bader Ginsburg is a time to think about, you know, what, what are things that we're experiencing today that we shouldn't be experiencing today? You know, what are the things that we would like to get rid of and change? Because we saw how she changed things in terms of equal pay, women in jobs, you know, competing with men. Where would Filipinos like to be com competitive? Where would we like to see Filipinos? Filipino Americans. So, I mean, obviously, we want to be in a better place, you know, than where we are right now. You know, we want to be better represented, you know. And I, and I, I really want to say one thing for a lot of the Filipinos nurses and the pro professionals that are out there on the front lines. You know, there's so many have sacrificed their own lives, right. and we need to mm -hmm. acknowledge that. And I mean. And, and there's, we can do better. We can do so much better, all of us as Filipino Americans and as Americans, you know, and, and, and again, we need to continue the, these kind of conversations. We need to continue the awareness and visit our museum. I, I miss the museum, Emil. Well, I, 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 I really do. 
you're, you're a big part of it. You gave a, a presentation last December, I remember. And, you know, one of the reasons why we do this is because we aren't able to have our live gathering. Right. The museum, you know, people shouldn't see the museum as a bunch of relics or things on the wall, but they should see it as a kind of gathering place, as a place that is our public square, you know, to come talk about Filipino American history and Filipino experiences. And when we have our programs, a way to share our stories, because our stories, whether or not, whether they're in the Filipino American newspapers or whether they're spoken and, you know, and shared orally, Filipino American history. And uh, that's our goal at the museum. So Luna Jamero, thank you very much for being with us today. And um, really, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to see you as always. And we'll be open, I think at some point, if, if the numbers drop down and everyone in San Joaquin County is good, maybe we'll have uh, as good a luck as some other counties that are actually opening museums uh, this yeah, week. I saw that. Yeah, right. the, the right. Asian, Asian Art Museum in San Francisco is opening up. Uh, right. I think there may be somewhat reduced capacity, but they are opening up. Um, you know, hopefully we'll be opening up soon. But in the meantime, I hope uh, you and everyone else who's listening in will check into our, our virtual pop-ups. We're here Saturday and Sunday. If you can't come to the museum, can't come to Stockton, you can check us out. We'll talk about some interesting things here on the Virtual Museum pop-up. Uh, it's on the Facebook page at Fonz, F-A-N-H-S Museum. So at the Facebook page at Fonz Museum. And I, uh, if you're watching, I wanna thank you for watching. I thank our guest, Luna Jamero. Back again tomorrow, we're gonna talk to Tony Ogilvie, who was the chair of the 1971 F Far West Conference, Filipino Youth Conference. And so that'll be an interesting conversation tomorrow. So Luna, thank you. Um, thank you, Emil. And our audience, thank you very much for joining us. We'll see you again uh, tomorrow. If you've missed any part of this, uh, stay on the page at Recycles. You'll see the page pop up in the record, the, the video pop up in the recorded form. Thank you again. I'm Emil Guillermo. Uh, have yourselves a great weekend. This is the virtual pop-up of the Filipino American National Historical Society Museum. And, and now I have to stop, no, not stop the recording. I have to actually end our live stream. But thank you very much, Luna. Thank you again. Thank you again. <laughs>